All right. Okay. So, hey, viewers. And we are back. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to take. And while I'm got all these creative juices flowing, I almost came back on last night. Um, I just want to dive back in on this little world, or I guess region, the larger world that I'm creating, and uh, and see where we're at. And uh, you know, I've got a few ideas to continue fleshing out, and we'll just see where that takes us. So, sort of review where we're at. Find that there, that's pretty good. Okay, so, right. and bring in that. Maybe the map's not going to work. Let's see that again. Capture the screen. It's there. All right, so that's the CC3 uh, campaign cartographer map that we came up with so far. Um, for reference and scale, this is about the same size if you captured the Aegean. So, and that's kind of the theme that we're going for. Um, so we've got some mainland or large islands. We're not sure entirely what these might be when we bleed off of the map. And, uh, you know, train's gonna have to be pretty rough, especially on the fringes, because we want this to be pretty self-contained. But the idea is we've got these three main land masses, we've got some islands. Um, we'll probably create a whole bunch more islands in here. This will be sort of a pretty self-contained sea with uh, lots of islands that it's easy to travel around in between. And in the middle, this group has nine major islands. And this is going to relate to the mythology of the world. So what we'd sort of decided was there is going to be sort of a mother and father creator figures, um, sort of just demiurge type gods. So like, you know, the god of gods, the ultimate creator gods, that sort of thing. And they had at least nine children maybe they've had more it depends on how messed up we make the pantheon um, we can go all zeus where there's all kinds of demigods and gods and things like that but there's going to be this main cluster of nine siblings and each of those nine siblings is a patron of one of what are called the nine tribes of man so the humans that live in this region are sort of divided into nine major groups, uh, each of which is led by a great house. And the progenitor of that great house was one of these nine sibling deities. So like the Ur king and queens of each of those tribes, the founders will be one of these siblings. Um, there's some other minor islands in here as well. Uh, and then we're going to have the ninth tribe and presumably the ninth deity as well are gone, um, missing. I don't want them to be dead. Um, I think the rough idea was way back in the mythological past. 
So not recent history, not even recorded history, really, but deep in the myth, there's some strife that happens among the siblings. Um, and I think this is going to relate to why this is a group of islands. I think initially this was going to be one island, sort of the Atlantis, as it were. And whatever mythological strife happened within that family is re reflected in the fact that this island has been sundered into pieces. Um, and then each of these pieces is then sort of associated with one of these nine siblings. Um, but I think originally, at least mythologically, all of the nine tribes lived here. Now, eight of those tribes still uh, live today and distributed all over this region. And the ninth left. And because there's a lot of uh, seafaring and sea mythology here, um, I think that the ninth tribe left by boat um, and sailed out. So presumably one of these directions, if we sail, and for whatever reason, I'm liking this southeast corner, connects out onto a larger sea or ocean that for whatever reason is much more difficult to sail in. It's, it's dangerous. Here there be monsters sort of thing. So they sort of sailed out uh, into the mythological great blue yonder, as it were, and, and who knows what has happened to them. And that will be reflected in the Pantheon as well. So there was a ninth sibling, but that deity doesn't uh, really figure into their mythology except as a sort of a mystery figure, you know, sort of like the stranger in, uh, in the, the Seven uh, in Game of Thrones, uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Now the question is too, uh, can you still go to these islands in the middle and visit them? Or is there like weird wonky effects happening because of whatever happened way back when in mythology? Um, I know that uh, Max, all Max D20, asked some questions about magical effects on terrain and you know how that um, touches into my world building. I'm still not sure. So for all of you guys um, watching, uh, feel free to like start throwing suggestions into chat uh, and talking this over with me kind of what you guys might think, what you folks might think rather. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the state of the map. And we'll come back, I think, in a little bit and do some more with that. But I'm going to hide that for now and go back to this. All right, so I had some, I guess, kind of refresh over the principles. So the principles of the setting is to sort of set your standard... Uh, almost like the setting Bible. Uh, it's the design principles. So all of these are things that are like do's and don'ts uh, or design touchstones, things that you want to evoke in your design uh, further on. And the organization of this is a bit of a mess. Some things need to move around um, in different headings. But um, so rule number one, and this was rule the first thing I put down, because it's actually very important, other than humans, I don't want any generic or standard fantasy races or species in this world. So there's no elves, there's no dwarves, there's no orcs, there's nothing like that. There might be ones that are stand-ins, there might be ones that riff off of those a little bit, but they'll definitely be unique. So I don't, I just, you know, kind of don't want that in the game. Um, here is something, though, that is fairly standard. In lots of fantasy settings, civilization um, is a pale echo of what once came before. So, you know, recovering after a fallen empire. So this can tie back into this mythological age that came before. And that mythological age... All right, so let me refresh chat here. Seeing that for whatever reason, chat is not showing up on my uh, in my OBS uh, Streamlabs. So I'll have to go back here periodically, I guess, to check. Um, 
chat. So MGS October asks whether this is a uh, volcan volcanic or earthquake prone area. And that's a great question. We talked about that a little bit last time. Um, Max asked sort of a very similar question. Maybe if I type in here. Um, asked a very similar question, which, uh, you know, can affect the geography. And I'm not 100% sure. I think maybe, um, you know, there certainly were earthquakes in the ancient world and we've got, you know, the volcanic eruptions like Santorini and things like that. Um, yeah, okay, now I get chat back in my Streamlabs, so that's great. Uh, so MGS October adds on that affects the myths as well. Exactly. So if there's a lot of earthquakes and volcanoes, that will certainly impact people's mythology. And so it could be, for instance, that that island, uh, you know, is volcanic or sits over, you know, something. And and there was presumably some natural event that uh, that shattered it. And so that's a really good question. And it's one that I'm not 100% sure on what the answer is in terms of do I want that island and, you know, pr presumably other events to stem from real and natural forces that affect the mythology or do I want the mythology, like, do I want that actually to have been a real magical ev event? <laughs> All right, thanks, Lisa. I know that you'll be around uh, when you've got time um, and commenting and asking lots of wonderful questions, I am sure. Um, so yeah, so that's a good question and I can go either way on that. Um, you know, it's how much do I wanna push it in the direction of sort of like our world where, you know, the gods and deities are kind of, you know, I don't wanna offend anybody, but like mythological, right? Um, versus the real world, or is it a fantasy setting where uh, the deities are definitely real and make themselves known in various ways? And I think I lean on them being real uh, and being very human and not being all powerful. So much more like the Greek gods in a way, much more like uh, a lot of the ascendants and gods as they are called in Stephen Erickson's Malazan novels. I think I want the deities to be absolutely real um, and to have real impacts on the world and be very human, but while not actually being human. So, you know, they make mistakes and they screw stuff up um, and maybe they're involved, but I think that they're gonna mostly stick to, you know, they've kind of learned their lesson and that directly involving themselves in the world and using their power to get what they want is generally a bad idea. Um, and maybe that's the kind of thing that led to the island being destruction and the sort of the sundering of the tribes and that sort of thing. So they were presumably much more active in the age of myth. They're still active enough that people know that they're real. Um, so yeah. Um, Civilization Pale Echo focused on this single region, right? So, it, and it kind of reflects the world of classical antiquity. It, it's narrower. Um, we don't have like the Middle East and Egypt um, and all those places that were also in contact with Greece in classical antiquity um, and later Rome. Um, presumably those places exist and I think that there will be contact with them, um, but for now, I want to keep it pretty constrained and just think about this place a little bit in isolation, other than maybe some broad strokes. Um, the world of magic is treated like the highest of sciences and philosophy. Um, yeah. Um, inherent tension between religion and religious power and magic. Um, and that's like the religious authorities. I think regular people are pretty deeply religious. And so they view sorcery with suspicion, whereas people in power make use of sorcery because it's useful. Uh, maze of city-states, small kingdoms, occasionally they get united, conquered into powerful but usually short-lived confederacies. Um, a patchwork of tribal and ethnic identities and cultures, but with lots of mixing. So this would be the nine, well, the eight tribes of man. 
Uh, mostly human, should have at least one, but perhaps two non-human sentient species. One of one or more of these, right, may be kind of related to humans, so like Neanderthals. Denisovans. So very close, closely related to humans. Um, having one that's quite alien might be interesting. Um, pseudo Greek, so this is like language. So I'm I'm gonna riff pretty heavily off of Greek philosophy of like classical antiquity and that sort of thing um, in this. And so language, I think, will also riff off of that. It makes it easier. Okay, so the world three main land, land masses. We need names for those. There's the nine, right? We've talked about these shared religious pantheon. We need a name for this C. Um, each of the eight tribes claims one of the siblings as their main deity, not their creator, but more like a patron. Um, the nine are somewhere between mythological heroes and deities, right? So this is the idea that they're not all powerful, but they are powerful and immortal or ostensibly immortal. Um, nobles have extensive genealogies that trace back to their progenitor deity, right? Whether that's actually true or not is probably debatable. Most of the time it's not. Um, but everyone always has to connect themselves um, back to one of these gods. The Ninth Tribe left after some conflict. There's a non-human species that lives in the region, mostly confined to the mountains, both on the interior of the mainland masses and on the fringes, scattered pockets. Um, and these are the Torva, which in their tongue means people of the mountain. And this is, they can interbreed with humans. Um, so they're, this is, again, going back to our design principles that we laid out early on. Um, religion, mythology, mother and father as creators. They're um, created, but they're not substantial. So, like, they're, um, I don't know, uh, they're not instantiated. They're not, they don't involve themselves in the world. Distant and perhaps uncaring parents. Um, right, children gets along, cause conflict. Nine great houses. Uh, sorcery magic. Magic is generally referred to as sorcery, so just like the terminology that in world is going to get used. Sorcery is the high art, the high science, and the high philosophy. Um, those who wield sorcery or wield the power of creation itself, which is why it is considered blasphemy by the religious. We need a term here to refer to schools, so like guilds, um, orders, organizations uh, that sorcerers belong to. Most of them belong to one of these because like safety in numbers. You know, if the common people don't trust you, then it's probably not really safe to be a sorcerer just wandering about on your own. You kind of need that protection and power. Sorcerers have ranks based on their learning and knowledge and power. So this is kind of like, um, uh, you know, like shared traditions even among these different schools. Um, and again, perhaps, you know, these schools have uh, something that kind of mirrors and echoes from this notion of like fracturing, right? So maybe there was one one school originally, the original school of sorcery, and then they've split you know, like family trees, and they can trace their way back to sort of the first sorcerer, basically. Um, but now they're all kind of separated. Um, sorcery in its terminology is going to be very steeped in the language of philosophy, so like metaphysics. Um, priests, yeah, so this is a good one. Do priests just use a sanctioned type of sorcery? And I think, yes. I'll just make that. Priests use a sanctioned type of sorcery but they do not see it this way so this is one of these things that's absolutely true but the way people see it in the game world isn't always reflective of like true reality um, so I had some other thoughts so sorcery as practiced by Sorcerers, otherwise known as high sorcery, 
is flashy. It is never subtle. It is always a use of force. I can never spell sorcerer. I always want too many R's or too many O's. Um, yeah, so this is the idea that, you know, high sorcery, at least the sorcerers use it. And this is one of the reasons why the religious would consider it blasphemy is you're doing something only gods and by extension priests, because priests are doing it at the behest of gods, should do. And so you're directly manipulating reality and that I think should always feel forced. It's always a use of force, always feels forced. It is a violation of the world. <laughs> MGS October. They, yeah, I like that. A pirate wizard is called a sorcerer. Indeed. Um, and uh, <laughs> that brings up a funny point. This is There's going to be a lot of uh, sea-going traditions here. Um, so, you know, sea witches and things like that will um, definitely have to come into play. However, okay, priestly magic is usually more subtle and more in tune with the natural world. At least in appearance. Um, and a little bit, uh, so priestly magic usually does not accomplish as big effects as high sorcery. So like, I kind of want the idea that like priestly magic, you know, it's kind of this trade off. It's, it's more of a nudge. It's a nudge. Whereas high sorcery is a sledgehammer. So like it's about how things look and feel. And I should note this higher up. Uh, da, 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 da. All magic is ultimately the same thing no matter who practices it. However, culture and training influence the appearance, methods, and extent of what can be accomplished by an individual practitioner. So like I want this idea that like in reality everyone's doing the same thing. But um uh, will let's capitalize will here. Right. So like I want this idea that deep down it's all the same thing. Everyone's really doing the same thing. Um, but essentially like how you were brought up, how you were raised, um, the culture you belong to influences all of your mental patterns. And so that ultimately limits or, or constrains what you can really do. So that's why priest magic looks different than that of sorcerers. But this also implies that that doesn't have to be true, right? You can have people that break the mold. So here, like we're talking about the generalities, but there's always going to be something unique, right? So you might get a particular priest who essentially learns high sorcery or vice versa. 
And I mean, we're going to assume those people are going to be important. Those people should probably be heroes or adventurers of some kind. Um, all right. So I had some other thoughts up here. Um, yes. So about a rising power. So this kind of ties into the idea rising power that is new and independent of the old structures of tribes and high houses. They are forging a nascent empire, although it has not yet reached that size and power. So I want the idea like this is like an empire in the process of being born. It's an empire in the process of being birthed and it sort of it throws off and rejects the old structures, right? This is an agent of change in the world. Um and whether they're Villainous or not, I actually don't want them to be villainous. Generally, they are good. They do bad things for the right reasons. And some ideas. Um, Yeah, so they're generally irreligious. So they kind of reject the religious beliefs. It's hard to argue with the fact that the gods are real. So it's not like they're atheists. It's not that they don't believe in those gods. It's that the religion and religious structures and the edicts and things like that, that's what they're sort of rejecting. So that's a construct and, you know, like the work of man. Reject the high houses. All human, all people belong. So they're very inclusive, right? So they forge new relationships across these tribal groups. Thank you very much, Miss B, for following. Hope that you are enjoying. All right. Um, forging your relationships. So this is, yeah, it's this rising power. It's an empire in the process of being born. The idea is it's, you know, like it's a force for change um, in the world. And I think generally a good one. Um, and I think the Torva are included in this, which is going to be unusual because I think the Torva have generally been at best second class citizens. You know, they're seen as like the barbarians. They've been pushed to the fringes as human humanity has grown. Um, there's probably some Torva that like live in the cities, but you know, they're they're sort of second class citizens looked down upon. Um, there'll be a whole thing, right? Because there'll be people that have a human that are the product of human and Torva um, relationships, right? So we're gonna have some things maybe that stem out of that. Um, let's see, the founders were essentially an adventuring party. So I'm going to flesh this out later, but I've got an idea that's sort of, again, you know, it, all of us creators steal from various sources. Um, this will riff a little bit off of one of my favorite series, so the Malazan books. Um, but seen at a different point in time. So this is when the empire is being forged. 
Um, so there'll be a, a small, close knit group of people that lead this new, you know, empire as it's being formed. And I think that they were essentially an adventuring party. You know, in world they were like mercenaries, pirates, you know, whatever. But I think that they're essentially an adventuring party. And that will explain one of the reasons why they're pretty inclusive, because they probably had one or more Torva and and maybe other non-humans as part of the party. And so that's going to lead to, you know, I think just a general, you know, more inclusive culture over other humans. And like weirdness, right? So who better to forge a new kingdom that does the right thing, but maybe does it by less than ideal means, um, the definition of sort of chaotic good. Um, and so, you know, this is probably they started out conquering a city, and I think at this point in time, taking over a city, have since added to their portfolio as it is. Um, so they'll have conquered some of these other places as well. So they've now got a pretty good foothold. And, you know, there might be some other confederacies and things like that of opposing places. So we're going to have some political tension, right? We're going to have some um, definite, like, factions and alliances that we can play off of. Uh, so Chet, Lisa, uh, religion in D&D is really interesting because the gods are indisputably real. They're almost more like a race in and of themselves. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the interesting things. Um, and I think we often don't think about it quite enough. Um, and, um, you know, what that really kind of means, I think, you know, sometimes we just take it for granted. Quite a significant number of players, I suppose, hold some sort of religious belief themselves. And so it's kind of just natural to kind of play off that. Um, but I don't know, like for me as an atheist, it's like, you know, it's, it's a really different thought process, right? Because they're undeniably real. Um, so it doesn't actually require faith, you know, the religion and things like that, right? When you can literally, I mean, I suppose a regular person can't just pray and have a miracle worked, but, you know, the priests and stuff. Um, yeah, and so MGS October asks, the gods don't have to be mystical or spiritual, it can be mortals who just became so powerful that they've seen as godlike. And yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and I don't know if you've read the Malazan books, but that's definitely like a lot of the, um, yeah, quote about, yeah, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, I think that was Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and yeah, so like in the Malazan books, for instance, is this notion of ascendancy. Um, so most of the gods and deities and then ascendants. And so the line between just being an ascendant and being a deity is essentially just whether you're worshipped or not. But there are people who've gone through, you know, something, um, you know, like a crucible or trauma, but they've acquired lots of power and lived a really long time. And you essentially, you essentially at some point in that power growth as you ramp up, you step over a line where you go from mortal to ascendant, right? So you've ascended into immortality. Um, and I really like that. I think here, the, the well, at least mythologically, these are all siblings. Um, but now that you've said that and made me think about it, I think that perhaps in reality, they're not, right? They're seen as siblings, um, they're super old. They're probably not actually human. They maybe predate humans. And the same thing, right? They were a family, but it may actually be that they they were essentially mortal who all ascended, right, uh, into immortality and godhood. I think you're on to something. I think I really like that. I want to separate this into a new bulleted list. I really like bulleted lists. Uh, I don't want it indented though. I want it at the same indent level. There we go. I just wanted a space. Um, yeah, exactly. They were a previous adventuring party. Yeah, that's exactly kind of what I was thinking. Um, like pre human, right? So, you know, Homo erectus, essentially, a group of adventurers you know, discover magic, um, 
rise to um <laughs> uh Lisa I had to allow <laughs> allow that um because the auto mod cracked down for your use of language. Um <laughs> no 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 need to apologize. Um I've got it set to sensitive, although we haven't needed it just in case, you know, when I'm when we're streaming something you know, and, and you get some troll comes in and decides to be a real asshole. Um, I, I just, I'd rather the auto mod catch it, but me myself, I'm, you know, I swear all the time on stream. So I've got no problem with the, uh, with the swearing. Um, and I think the auto mod is actually mostly targeted at sexual euphemism, euphemisms, um, just to help nip, you know, misogyny in the bud, uh, in the stream. But I actually have no problem with what you said. So I allowed it through. Um, so yeah, I want to put here in reality, the gods were once mortal and they are not actually siblings. Previous adventuring party, the human sentient species, etc. Gathered enough power immortal bloated lists are like multiple orgasms um <laughs> mgs october uh yeah i i just i find uh you know uh watching uh matt colville matt colville really likes uh excel and i think word as his like design things of choice i like bulleted lists um I find it's just a good way for me to get quick points down and then I can come back and expand on them later and like change, turn them into paragraphs and split them. Um, I just find it's a good way of getting things down. Uh, I could also do this in a, in a tool like uh, Trello or something. Yeah, they're neat. Uh, if I don't make them too long, they're easy to read. Um, yeah, I think it's just... I think coming from an academic background where I put together presentations all the time, like PowerPoint presentations to like talk to people to convey information. If I have to put text, I like to put bulleted lists of some kind because it emphasizes the points and it kind of forces you to not ramble. Um, it's, you know, graphics are better, but not for something like this. Um, so yeah, so I want this idea of in reality versus what people in the world believe. This is not what people in the world, at least widely, because there might be some people that know, right? Like some really learned um, wizards and like people that just delve into knowledge that's forbidden, that you shouldn't delve into. You know, they might have sussed this out. Um, we may discover this in the course of play, but I think it's not something that's widely known. That's always one of the hard things with some of these settings, um, especially when it comes to the point of like making a setting book or guide is, you know, putting in that meta, you know, the absolute truth versus the in-world truth. Um, and I'm never sure which, you know, how far to crank the dial one way or the other for that. And so it depends. I do like the approaches of things like 13th age and stuff where they'll put in some people believe this and some people believe this and some people believe this and, and they kind of leave it open because you know, the world is a messy place. Um, but at the same time, I also like designing things where if I was going to turn this into a book series, I should know kind of what the truth is. Um, or no. So we can come back to this. Um, what else we got here? Uh, what else we got going on here in chat with MGS October and Lisa? Um, we had some stuff. Yeah, God's don't have to be mystical. Um, Yeah, players being able to actually communicate with their deity. Yeah, or like high-level priests, right? Like maybe low-level priests can't, but 
you've got a reasonably high-ish, or, you know, and high might be, like, in D&D terms, like, level two or something, um, being able to, like, actually commune with them, it like, that is a really big deal. Uh, yeah, OneNote. I sort of like OneNote. I don't know. I've gone back and forth. Um, these days, in particular, I like doing most of my writing in uh, in the Google suite, because then... I have access to it anywhere, and I mean, I do have OneDrive and things like that, so ostensibly on all my devices I have access to anything Microsoft as well, but uh, I like the Google suite, um, any computer, I can pop open my phone, tablet, whatever, um, type everything and not worry about versions and saving. Um, da -da -da. Yeah, as long as the gods aren't too helpful. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing, right, is why would people do anything if your priest can just, like, literally pray and get help, right? And we sort of always, um, in our fantasy worlds, especially in, in like, D&D &D worlds, I think rely on, and it's a little bit of a crutch, but, um, you know, like, in the real world, like, the idea of, like God works in mysterious ways and um, you know, that certain things are ordeals that you're meant to go through and it's valuable to do it on your own. So we just sort of have this idea that the gods are wise and are like, you know, dude, you need to solve this yourself. But then at the same time, I mean, they give the cleric like literally answer their prayers and they get high enough level and he's like, dude, I need like, some major help and they summon a, an angel to come kick ass for them. Um, I like, and again, it's sort of like the Malazan world. Um, and I think in some ways Colville kind of played with this in his books as well, which is the idea of power and like escalation. So like in the Malazan world, power draws power. So if this, if an ascendant sort of unveils themselves and uses their, you know, god-like powers it tends to result in other ascendants who are like opposed to whatever they're doing to just joining the fray and when ascendants fight like a whole city could be destroyed essentially right or like large sections of it and so some of them are more prudent right they've learned that this is a bad thing right they have sensibilities they don't want innocent people to get hurt um, and so there are quite a number of ascendants who end up then becoming more like manipulators, right? They do stuff behind the scenes. They give, they give nudges. They give a little bit of help. They don't, you know, it's almost like uh, the great game, right? Where they're playing off of each other. And so I think we're going to have something like that here too. Let's go back. Another bulleted list here. The eight, or perhaps nine. Sibling gods are involved in a great game. Shifting um, playing field of alliances antagonisms operate mostly like a cold war through mortal proxies so they do a lot of manipulating nation nudges subtle aid Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, deities or clerics of opposing deities sort of being able to, to sense, you know, the touch of a god on you. Um, and yeah, I sort of like that, especially if you're like a particularly powerful cleric or particularly devout or something like that, um, where sort of the influence and, you know, for instance, channeling divine magic. leaves its mark it changes you um right there was one other thing i had here right yeah and i think there was a disaster um, 
fireworks going off outside. Mine. Oh. They're sort of accessible, but dangerous. Was one island. I think Atlantis, but shattered during. This call altercation that sundered the gods and forced the ninth tribe exile. Oh, yeah, because you're in Ontario, right? MGS October. I forget if it was Ottawa or, or whatever. Yeah, I think there's actually three official days of fireworks here in Halifax for Natal Day. I forget what the what the holiday is called in Ontario. Um so I don't know if these are neighborhood ones or probably given the time, they, they might be some kind of official one. They sound pretty distant. Yeah, no, I know it's your, I, I always, I just forget what Ontario, um, calls, calls it. Ours is today too. I think pretty much every province has one today. They're just all called something different. Summer holiday. Um, all right. So that got a bunch of things down there. People and creatures. <laughs> we have the nine tribes of humans, eight of whom still live in the sea. We call figure out a name for that. There are also humans outside of this area, but they are not part of the nine tribes. Caveat to that is, although sometimes one or more of these groups is thought or claimed to be the lost slash missing ninth tribe. Um, so you can tell this kind of riffs off the whole like tribes of Israel thing, right? Where, you know, you get like a religious group that claims that, you know, the Ethiopians are the lost what was it, 12th tribe or, or whatever, um, or Native Americans or like this group or that group or whatever um, in terms of the, the tribes of Israel. So there's a bit of a bit of that vibe going on. And I'm not entirely sure on where that's going to go, right? I don't actually have a plan for this yet. Um, I think to start, it's really good to leave that as a mystery. And in fact, if you're you know, it's a bit different if I'm designing this for a uh, book versus gaming. Um, although I'm kind of doing it as like a little bit of both, you know, not that I, I might never ever use it, but it's kind of me. I'm designing it to be kind of general. From a gaming perspective, I think keeping that an absolute mystery is more useful because it gives the, it gives DMs something that's uh, an obvious hook that they can use creatively in um, coming up with campaigns, right? You can bring in something about the Ninth Tribe and, and whatever. And on that note, like, you know, the book, right, the setting guide, whatever it is, should have, like, a bunch of juicy suggestions or, like, prophecies or, you know, following that, like, some people say this and some people say that. 
blah 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 about the ninth tribe because those give like in world confusion so there's an in world state of confusion but they all give ideas to the game master on things that they might use um the torva people of the mountain Evolutionarily related to humans. Neanderthal. Um, live mostly in mountain regions. Mountainous regions. Particularly on the frontier. So that's where they're mostly going to live. Um, what do they look like? I think they're squat. I think mountain people should not actually be tall. As much as I love to riff on, on the whole giants thing. But I think they should be squatly built. Um, you know, mountain goats and things like that. They're stocky, tough. Although one could argue that being long and lean is good for rock climbing. But I think that people that actually live in mountainous regions, or like animals that adapt to mountains, um, aren't really rock climbers. I mean, mountain goats and mountain sheep and things like that being a bit of an exception. But still, they're pretty squatly built too. They just got funny feet. Better constitution. Yeah, absolutely. Because they got to deal with like colder weather too. Squat build. They're hardy. They're strong. Right? So again, this kind of, you know, and, and we might just, just really pull off of Neanderthals quite a bit in terms of what they look like. Um, I think they've got longer arms than humans do. That was also true of Neanderthals. It gives you better leverage. Right, breathing at higher elevations, yeah. They're adapted to high altitude. Um, and we've got lots of human groups that have done this too. Um, this applies some implies something. Um, so evolutionarily, this probably implies, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years at least, maybe more, that they've been living at high altitude. Um, and of course, again, like Neanderthals and humans, um, maybe the Torva have spread all over, um, but I think they've maybe been um, fragmented and split up. Uh, they kind of live more in pockets. So there's probably other but maybe calls themselves something but related just like there's other humans out there what do I teach um, yeah so um, uh, I, I teach a few things so teaching isn't my primary um, appointment I primarily actually do clinical work uh, most of the time and do research and I do a little teaching um, I mostly I just teach in a couple of other people's courses on human genetics um, so I, I teach some technology related stuff, uh, that has to do more with like my job. So big data and genomics. Um, but I also teach the population genetics and evolutionary genetics lecture in that course, which they are only like one lecture each. It's not like a huge section. Um, and I teach in some bioinformatics courses as well, um, about applications, uh, medical applications of bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is sort of the intersection between computer science and biology. So that is mostly what I teach. Uh, I did my PhD in molecular evolution and then switched into doing more human genetics, sort of at genome scales with my postdoctoral fellowship. And that's what I do for a day job. But so, yeah, so, you know, 
that's why there's always lots of evolutionary thinking about species and species relationships in my work because I spent like a decade of my life and I still kind of do that so I spent a lot of time thinking about it and so it's you know very informative of my thinking um, and I like to think about you know archaeology and anthropology and sociology and sort of how all those things you know should interact with one another to create the peoples that we see um, and sometimes though that means like coming up with something afterwards that we like and then sort of figuring out how we get from point a to point b uh Lisa, tusks yeah i i do like i do like tusks um let's say enlarged canines Perhaps just the lower to make tusks. Which implies probably a heavy carnivorous diet. Well, that can be tough living in the mountains. Although plants are hard to gather in mountains too, so maybe being highly... Um, meat oriented makes sense uh go down to the lower slopes and hunt big game and bring it back not that i mean you can have tusks for other reasons most animals have tusks for um oh yes yeah, it's true uh, it's lower but it's usually not for biting so things like saber tooth cats and stuff usually have their upper canines elongated Right, because they use that for um, gripping and, and and biting. Whereas tusks, you know, usually they were thinking like pigs, like boar, um, elephants, things like that. And usually there it's used for display, um, but can also be used for like rooting in the earth. Um, but primates getting down and sticking your face in the dirt to root around doesn't really make sense because we have hands. So I'm just going to assume they probably got a heavy carnivorous diet. That's the, the tusks. Although it could just be sexual selection. Uh, it could be that uh, male or, or lady Torva really like big teeth, big canines, and uh, sexual selection has driven bigger and bigger canines. Also probably fairly small. They're not huge. That takes a lot of work to adapt a jaw and get big, heavy tusks. Um, if they're relatively closely related to humans, um, phenotypically, we can only kind of go so far. Like big tusks, and I cannot lie. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm not thinking like, you know, uh, some of the orc depictions where you've got, you know, big, like, three-inch tusks or something. Um, I'm thinking that, that maybe the tips just barely poke out from the lower lip um, up to the upper lip when they can be seen so they don't like go over it. Um, maybe a little bit bigger. Ah, they probably decorate their tusks. So think of things like capped with precious metals. Engraving, right? Carving your own, getting your own teeth carved is uh, pretty hardcore. World building, yes. Thanks for joining 9P, 9P1. Um, sort of a second part on this sort of Aegean world and, uh, and seeing what we come up with. Um, yeah, definitely. I think they, they decorate their tusks, right? It's hardcore to like engrave your teeth. Um, so like a sign of strength, uh, toughness, fortitude, bravery, uh, capping them with pre precious metals, right? Because it's like wealth, showing off wealth. Um, you know, probably for all intents and purposes, they're while they have a heavy carnivorous diet, they're, uh, the tusks aren't necessarily super... Useful. Yes, yeah, Scrimshaw, that's the word. Scrimshaw teeth. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, exactly. Do they dye their tusks? That's a good question. 
that might be. Uh, I don't know. How hard is enamel to dye? Does anybody know? I mean, I know that they dis it discolors easily. Um, but how about dyeing them? And would that be permanent? That's a good question. I mean, because you can think of something like the equivalent of tattooing. Um, you know, maybe they carve them and like inlay them with something. You know, inlay. Tusk polish. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you could polish them, but yeah, thinking about how you would color them. Inlay might be a way, though, if you engrave them. Um, all right, so that's some stuff on... Yeah, maybe not permanent, more of a battle thing. Yeah, exactly, like war... Yeah, like war paint. Um, I mean, again, uh, it sort of depends on how big they are. Yeah, into tusk gems. They can definitely have some tusk bling. Um, you know, if you're if you've got bigger tusks, right, that really jut out like a, a inch or two out of your lower lip, you could, you know, they're visible enough that you could really do some elaborate stuff. Whereas if they're smaller, which is kind of what I was initially thinking, like you know, the tip kind of just pokes out to maybe just just above your upper lip you know in size so you know it's like quarter inch to half an inch coming out from your lower lip um, that's relatively small so you might not do as much to them because they're not as visible um, but again we could go with bigger tusks right um, I'm not sure and you could also have you know in interesting things where like maybe they peel back their their lower lip to show you know how how much has been done to their tusks right um you know thinking of things like um tribal like hakas and like war dances and things like visible things you might do um so you could like pull down your your lower lip to show off your your big tusks and what you've done to them All right. Um, yeah, this should all come back. Um, yeah. So adapted to high altitude, large canines, longer arms, strong, hardy. Uh, squat build hair colors so we could go the pretty stereotypical you know um, Neanderthals that's probably where things like red hair came from in humans uh, cowards tusks are removed by the tribe good point MGS October um, and uh, something we've seen with half orcs on critical role but I like it. Uh, well, I guess no. Sorry, uh, Ford filed his filed his down. They weren't removed. Ooh, one for each transgression. Yes, I like that. I like that. Um, cowardice and transgressions against the tribe result in let's say egregious. It's not all transgressions, but particularly bad ones. Egregious. Um, against the tribe result in removal of a tusk. People always get a second chance. I like that. Um, because that's that says something. Uh, there's black market trade in tusks for cowards who head into the world. Yeah, absolutely. They're, you're like you know, if you get uh, a torva in the city, maybe they like wear a prosthetic tusk, right? Like a denture, an implant, um, to hide that they're missing a tusk. And you know, they figure 
they're out away from their people, so they wouldn't notice. But I, I really like that that what you said about second chances, um, where where you always get a second chance, right? And so maybe there is actually something to be said about you know, um, Torva with one tusk who are who are big heroes, right? Like because then it's a redemption story. Um, people that did something wrong and they got punished, but they still were then able to rise above their mistakes. And I like this. Tuskless Torva are outcast and exiled. And it may be like in the human settlements that the majority of Torva that they've seen are actually Tuskless, right? Because um, it's outcasts and exiles. And so that might lead to some, maybe some stereotypes. Are most of the Torva seen in human settlements? Say, perhaps most Torva seen in human settlements are Tuskless. Tuskless. Bad apples. Origin of negative stereotypes. Don't trust get a Tuskless Torva. Uh, yeah, although in this case I'm thinking like, you know, people might not really know better. Um but I, I do like that don't trust a tuskless torva. Um and so, you know, this idea of torva being, you know, shifty or lazy or something. But it's it's borne out almost exclusively the fact that most of the torva that encounter humans on a day to day basis are shifty, like, you know, cowards and things like that but i'm gonna never trust i'm gonna put this in quotes trust the trustless tuskless torva i really like that quote that's definitely something that humans humans say this phrase Torva don't. I mean, because that would just be implied, right? Of course you don't trust a Tuskless Torva. They're Tuskless. Um, but humans maybe have this phrase. Um, jumping again to hair colors. Um, I actually like the idea that most of it's dark or red. Dark. Most of their eyes are dark. I think they have epicanthic folds. Um, right, because maybe high altitude sun on snow kind of thing so it's an adaptation um eye color mostly dark although i'll have to check these and see because there might be an advantage to them having light eyes at high altitudes or something but probably not i think you know our high altitude adapted peoples that we know of we've got like the ethiopians um um You know, the Andes and the Himalayas, and all that sort of thing. So they're pretty varied. Um, yeah, so you've got kind of a general picture, right? Hardy, squat build, strong. Let's see, squat build. What's average height? Let's see. Most heights are like.
five, two to actually I wonder if we're Neanderthal heights. Uh, Neanderthal anatomy. Males average sixty five to sixty six inches. So that's that's five six. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's say most sites are five, three, like five, eight, somewhere in that range. And around 170, 40, 140 to 180 pounds, we'll say. I'm not doing separate male, female. Um, I'm actually going to assume males and females are not overly dimorphic in height, weight, strength, etc. Just screw it. Let's actually nip any of that stuff in the bud, right? Uh, the Torva don't have a huge difference between their genders in physical abilities. They're right around the same height, weight, strength, all that stuff. Um, and so they believe in fairness, quality, cooperation. Cooperation makes it happen. Um, yeah, I always like to have at least one group of people for which this is true, this kind of thing, very egalitarian. Um, and communal. But this also, it's not just, it also means everyone bears the same obligations and should make the same sacrifices. So like a bunch of communists. Have they always believed in gender equality or is it a more recent thing? Um, so in this case, I'm stemming this out of their, their physical nature, right? So I'm saying that because they are physically, you know, you don't have this big difference between men and women in terms of like, um, height and strength and things like that, that it's kind of their biology uh, that's underlying a bit of their culture. So they've always been pretty equal. Now, the counterpoint to that would be, you know, you still only have presumably women that can bear children. Uh, and that's one other reason that people speculate that you might have um, mismatches in gender equality and gender roles in human cultures right throughout history. Um, but I don't think that has to be true. And, you know, we can, we can look at other primates where, you know, that are more um, matrilineal and uh, female powered. And, and it's still uh, women that, right, bear children. Um, they may have some issues when it comes to like, say warfare, um, but I think that also they live in a rough, you know, um, they live in a rough region. Um, life is hard, right? It's hard in the mountains. And so the fact that, that life is hard means that everyone kind of has to do, has to really pitch in. Um and bear the same burdens and sacrifices. And so I think that also tends to engender a lot of quality.
do the Torva. Or with each other in particular. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. And but again, cultures varied, right? So we we know of some cultures where um perhaps, you know, the majority of warriors were men, but certainly women could do so as well. Um and, it, and so I think here the Torva rarely fight each other. And that's because distance and separation. But also because of humans. Right? Um, you've got, you know, they've got a hard existence. They're probably also often separated because they live in the mountains. So getting from one clan to another is difficult. Um, I should say. But sometimes they do. Right? They're not a bunch of peace-loving hippies. And it's not, it's not that. It's just you've got other problems. Right? So they tend not to go fight each other as much. Um, but they do fight because humans... Um, what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, you know, it's not necessarily defeatist. Um, so, but I think they've been fighting a losing rearguard action for generations, right? As humans have cultures have grown and expanded, um, and pushed them out to the fringes and like deeper into the mountains. Yeah. Humans are dicks. <laughs> That's kind of a recurring theme for me. Humans are dicks to people that aren't human. Because um, humans are dicks to other humans, right? You know, we're a bunch of assholes sometimes. Um, but yeah, so the, the Torva being being pushed, right, for generations. And so I think that's going to give you a particular outlook because they've essentially been losing, right? Only... Only... Ever known small victories, but perhaps recently won a big victory for the first time. This is a question mark, right? Maybe, yeah, pessimistic philosophy, but maybe. Like, for instance, in the game, right before the game starts, um, they recently won a big victory. Maybe there was there was some big battle where some alliance of Torva clans fought some particular army and broke them, right? And that engenders a new sense of renewal. Um, maybe, there's, maybe there's a difference in the younger generation versus older generations. I'm not sure, right? So this is ideas. Yeah, a bit of Russian humor. Yeah, I think I think they have a black humor. Um, they have a lot of jokes that have to do with like losing and death, things like that. Battle of Bloody Slopes. Yeah. Bloody, bloody sloops. Yeah. Um, and these are questions, right? I'm leaving this a bit open. I kind of like this idea, um, but I'm not sold on it just yet. All right. Well, I think that gives us a pretty good start on the Torva and a few other things. Filled in some things. 
still definitely going to need names. Um, all the tribes, things like that. Um, I think I'm going to have to do a little research on maybe some different Greek words and naming conventions for tribal people and ethnicities and things like that. Um, and all of these, but that, once we get that name, that, that group of nine names is going to name both like the high house and tribe, um, which will basically be the same name, but also the God. So whatever their patron, whatever that patron deity is. So like that one name does like double or triple duty, um, naming like all of them. Um, so we've got some things here, sorcery and stuff as well. Um, we haven't touched the map. Yeah, that's true, Litsa. So I like the rising up as one after they want a victory. Could you factions, those who want to unite and push back, and those who want to hunker down and just hold the line. Exactly. Um, so that's a whole thing. Math? What about math? 9P, 9P1? Like for terminologies? Like numbers? Could do that. No, I didn't say math. Um, I'm not sure what I said that maybe sounded like math. Um, now we're talking about the gods and the nine clan or nine tribes and um, high houses and that sort of thing. Um, I might have said myth at one point. Um, but so the idea is we come up with a name for that. It'll do like triple duty. Oh, map, map. I said I hadn't touched, I had started to say we hadn't touched on the map um, again in a little bit. That's what it was. Yeah, so we, so the, so the map from Campaign Cartographer, um, we haven't really touched on it all other than this. Um, definitely needs some more islands, maybe some adjustments to some of the coastline because it is looking a little crowded. Um, but just for perspective, like I said, this is the Aegean, but the distance from like this point, to let's say like this island is 73 miles. So that's pretty tight. Um, what is the distance of straight Gibraltar? I always use this for a reference. Um, straight to Gibraltar, I think it's like 20 miles or something, uh, eight, nine miles, 8.9 miles, ocean's narrowest point. All right. I like knowing things like that to give myself a little bit of a baseline reference. So let's see what some of these closest 15. Okay, so yeah, we've got some places in here that are like the Straits of Gibraltar um, between these islands, but uh, that's normal. And like I said, there might be weird things going on here. Maybe not. Um, but we could certainly draw some more islands. That would be possible. Um, I just don't want it to get too, too crowded. Let's... Zoom in down here. Make a bit of a bigger island. Some of these are going to be relatively small. Distance across is like six miles, right? So those are relatively small islands. Need some big ones, big er. The trick is going to be because you know I want this group of nine right, to be relatively distinct from the surroundings. 
so they don't get lost in the shuffle. can draw some more in there. That island probably has some significance because it's like the last major island before you go out into the wider sea or ocean. So it's probably important. So it's bigger than what place? Like having some region where there's a whole cluster of small islands. Uh, yeah, one of the yeah, I guess it probably does look like Michigan. Uh, da -da. Yeah, I've got friends, Lita, that live just outside uh, Detroit. Um, she's a professor at uh, was it the University of the University of Oakland? No, what's it? Yeah, something like that. Like just outside of Detroit. Um, no, not UDM, is it? Oakland University. Anyway, yeah, it's in Michigan. Anyway, friend of mine, prof there. Um, all right. Just wondering uh, if I had any other major things. Yeah, I know that they, you know, go into Detroit itself. I think I forget where it is exactly that they live. Um, outside, but I know that they easily get to Detroit, Detroit, Metro, downtown, hockey games, that kind of thing. Uh, right. Did I have anything else that I definitely had ideas for flush out? I don't think I did. Let's just see, though. I want to see, oh yeah, this is the ancient worlds. So if we started putting things like mountains,
something there. Great Peak. See, then when we refresh that, it'll cut the stuff off that's outside. Thanks for joining MGS October. We'll probably be signing off actually in just a minute. It's getting pretty late for me and I got to go back to work tomorrow after this three day weekend because I'm an hour ahead of you. So it's 1030 here. But uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, I'll probably be doing another one of these. Um, Tomorrow night have Underdark Clouds, so we'll have an actual stream game going on tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday, I am usually at a trivia night, so I'm not here. Um, but I think Thursday, I may come back to this. It's like the idea of... Clean in some of these mountains. You know, I think sort of implied that there were mountains along the edges of a lot of this place because um, it's got to be pretty mountainous. It's one of the things I like about Campaign Cartographer. It makes this sort of thing pretty easy. So we've actually got some mountain going right down. The whole place is probably pretty mountainous. Hills. Put things like that in there. Um, rivers and stuff we'll do later. Forests. We'll put in some major forests in places. that last one because it was the goes between the two yeah All right, save that. 
All right, so I think that gets us going and uh, made some progress. So thanks again, everyone, for joining in, uh, for contributing in chat. Uh, craters and Volcanoes. Um, I think that there is... Um, In, I definitely can in the tool. Um, I think that the design set that I am in, which is like ancient or classic, I forget, ancient empires or something like that is what it's called. I don't think it has any, um, it doesn't have any icons like these maps or sorry, like these mountains and stuff for volcanoes uh, or craters. I've got cliffs and a cliff and a chasm. So for instance, oh, that might be a good place to put it. You know, something like that, like a chasm. Um, you can do cliff type edges. You can do oases. Um, Desert, swamp, um, and there's terrain types for those as well. Wastelands, desert, um, but I don't think it has any volcanoes and no craters. Got some other like icons, but there are other map things that I own that do have those icons and um, it's possible to load them. So you can you can do quite a lot with campaign cartographer. Um, it is it's like a it's a CAD program, so it some things are needlessly complex in it, seemingly, because it's not really a drawing program. Um, and some things are hard. Other things are stupidly easy. Um, and there's like effects that I can get into and we'll get into that later with like labeling. And uh, I'll probably have to delete a bunch of like these mountains and redo them at some point. Um, but uh, it's in a decent place. I'm gonna close that. Um, oh, welcome back MDS October. I think I'm basically just signing off because um, it's, 10, uh, almost 11 for me, uh, on the East coast and I got to work again tomorrow and I'm tired. <laughs> um, but this has been great. Uh, been running for, uh, you know, hour and a half or so live getting some ideas down. Um, and this is pretty much my process, at least in a, when I'm doing it in a more formal kind of way where I'm doing it like this. Um, you know, I'm often doing more, you know, if I, if I, in the moment, I often want to come up with names. And so then I end up going down deep Wikipedia holes and Google translate things coming up with words and names that I want to use. Um, I'm not doing that right now. Um, I might do that offline and come up with like some lists of things that I want, um, or that I like for Thursday, uh, when I come back to this. But yeah, thank you guys so much for joining and chatting and contributing some awesome ideas and asking good questions. Uh, and so I think I will be back on, uh, on Thursday. So.